Regal Pale, one of America's two great beers, and the high-flying, fun-loving Regal Bird bring you now Ozark Jubilee. Unless you've lived many moons past the half-century mark, you won't remember it, but there was a time when nationally broadcast television shows originated right here in the Ozarks. Let's go back in the hills to remember one of the shining jewels of our musical crown, the Ozark Jubilee. The new technology of television first came to Springfield, Missouri, the Ozark region's largest town, in 1953, and it didn't take local entrepreneurs long to hatch major dreams. For years, Ralph Foster's Springfield radio station, KWTO, the call letter stood for Keep Watching the Ozarks, had produced many local music programs, gathering a stable of talented musicians, singers, and behind-the-scenes personnel in the process. For a few years in the 1940s, the station had even produced its own Saturday night barn dance show. Called Corns a Kraken, it was broadcast across the nation on the ABC radio network. That show's executive producer was Springfield native Cy Simon, and when TV came along, Simon, Foster, and a couple of local backers founded Crossroads Productions to develop programming, and it was hoped challenged Nashville as the crossroads of country music. One of their earliest efforts was a TV show called Ozark Jubilee, which first aired locally on Springfield's KYTV on the night after Christmas in 1953. But Simon and Foster had their sights set on the big time. Simon went to Nashville and pitched his vision to one of the country music world's heavyweights, Red Foley. Born in 1910 in Blue Lick, Kentucky, Foley had gotten his start almost a quarter of a century earlier on Chicago's popular National Barn Dance radio program. He later came back home to help start a stage and radio show known as the Renfro Valley Barn Dance. Equally adept at performing country, boogie-woogie, and gospel, Foley also possessed an easygoing, friendly personality that came across on radio. The producers of the nationally broadcast segment of the Grand Ole Opry noticed and tapped him to be the show's MC and headliner in 1946, a role that helped Foley achieve a string of top country hits and launched him to superstardom. But Mr. Country Music's personal problems cost him his job on the Opry in 1953. Still, Cy Simon knew his plan for making Springfield the crossroads of country music depended on star power, and he convinced Foley that a fresh start was just the thing he needed. With Red Foley's name attached to the project, Simon and his associates traveled to New York and sold ABC television executives on the idea of a music variety show broadcast across the nation each week from the Jewel Theater in Springfield. It sounds far-fetched to modern ears, but this was, after all, the early days of TV. It wasn't just a New York-L.A. thing yet. This rejiggered version of the Ozark Jubilee, with Red Foley at the helm and the Jewel Theater, hit the airwaves as a radio show in July 1954 and went nationwide on the ABC radio network two weeks later, on the first day of August. The TV version began airing locally on KYTV a month later, with plans to go nationwide on ABC in early 1955. The production hit a bit of a snag, however, when it was discovered that a new kind of telephone wire would have to be installed in Springfield in order to pipe the Jubilee up to Chicago and from there across the country. The Queen City of the Ozarks didn't have the technological infrastructure needed for crossroad status just yet. So when the date of the first national broadcast on ABC TV rolled around, January 22, 1955, the Ozark Jubilee came into living rooms not from the Ozarks, but from station KOMU on the campus of the University of Missouri in Columbia. In fact, the first 13 episodes of the Jubilee were broadcast from Columbia before everything was up to snuff at the Jewel. The Ozark Jubilee wasn't the first country music show broadcast over a national television network but it was the first to achieve sustained success over a long period of time, almost six years, and it was the first to feature the industry's biggest names. Most weeks highlighted at least one guest star, and that list is a who's who of country and western stardom in the 50s. Gene Autry, Tex Ritter, Bob Wills and the Texas Playboys, Roy Acuff, Hank Thompson, Eddie Arnold, Jim Reeves, Webb Pierce, Johnny Cash, 
Three of the Jubilee's regular performers used the show as a launching pad to country superstardom. Alabama native Sonny James, homegrown Ozarker Porter Wagner, and pint-sized Georgia sensation Brenda Lee. The fact that Wagner and Lee both left Springfield for Nashville in 1957 was a clear indication that Middle Tennessee would remain the epicenter of country music. But Springfield's showbiz days weren't over yet, and there's plenty more to say about the Ozark Jubilee. For now, we'll play our way off stage with the help of Red Foley in the opening moments of the very first episode of Ozark Jubilee, actually broadcast from the Ozarks on the last day of April in 1955. The Jewel Theater in Springfield, Missouri. It's time for the Ozark Jubilee, starring America's favorite country gentleman, Red Foley! Thank you so much, folks. Bless you. Bless you. <laughs> well, so we got a wonderful crowd here tonight, and this is the big night I want you to know for all of us connected here with the Ozark Jubilee. We know we've moved our permanent home here to Springfield, and boy, we're having a big time here at the Jewel Theater. And we're so grateful to the many, many people who have made this possible for us. And to all of you folks who are here in person tonight, uh, say welcome home. Well, we're going to trot out a little song here now. Boys, the salt it down, something like the salty dog rag. Well, the way down yonder in the state of Arkansas, where well, my great grandpa met my great grandpa. They drink apple cider and they get on a check. They all that dance to the salty dog rag. One foot front, drag it back. If your partner sings, you're supposed to sing. Your heart is light, you tap your feet in rhythm with that ragtime beat. Pack up your troubles in your old kit bag and dance all night to the salty dog rag. <laughs> Today, it's probably best known as headquarters and site of the flagship store of Bass Pro Shops, one of the world's largest retailers of hunting and fishing gear. But in the middle of the 20th century, Springfield, Missouri, queen city of the Ozarks, was a hot spot for musical entertainment. In addition to the dozens of locally produced shows that ran on radio and TV stations, back in the hills of the Ozarks, Springfield had its own nationally broadcast barn dance show, Corns a Kraken, which aired on the ABC radio network in the 1940s. And for almost seven years in the 1950s and early 60s, country music variety TV shows came streaming into living rooms from coast to coast, straight from Springfield. These shows sent some native Ozarkers on to national stardom and left a lasting legacy that would impact the Ozark music and entertainment scene long after Springfield's showbiz days came to an end. In our first installment of the Ozark Jubilee, we highlighted MC Red Foley and Springfield's attempt to challenge Nashville as the crossroads of country music. Despite a few technical glitches, the show got off to a good start in early 1955. The Jubilee followed the time-tested formula of the barn dance show. Musical numbers interspersed with square dances featuring caller L.D. Keller and his Ozark promenaders and comedy routines. No one brought the house down more often than Uncle Sipe and Aunt Sap, played by real-life husband and wife Lawrence and Neva Brasfield. Red Foley had plenty of practice playing the straight man from his years on the Grand Ole Opry, whose chief comic was Lawrence Brasfield's brother Rod. Millions of viewers got to know the show's up-and-coming regular performers. The earliest Jubilee regulars included mostly young artists who had charted a country song or two in the top 40, but were a right smart from becoming household names. People like Texan Arlie Duff, Floridian Bobby Lord, rockabilly sensation Wanda Jackson from Oklahoma, Marvin Rainwater from Kansas, 
West Virginian Hawkshaw Hawkins and female honky-tonker Jean Shepard, raised in an Oakey family in California. Hawkins and Shepard met on the show and later married, and Jean gave birth to Hawkshaw Jr. just a month after the airplane crash that killed Hawkins and Patsy Klein. The Ozark Jubilee also featured local entertainers. Without a doubt, the most famous Ozarker to emerge from the Jubilee was Porter Wagner. Working in a grocery store in his hometown of West Plains, Missouri, the angular and affable Wagner began performing on a local radio show in the late 40s, and by 1951 was a regular on Springfield's powerful KWTO. By the time he became one of the headliners on Ozark Jubilee in 1955, he was already a regional celebrity, but his first number one country hit that year, Satisfied Mind, catapulted Wagner to country stardom. Within two years, he and his steel guitar player and personal manager, fellow Missouri Ozarker Don Warden, were on their way to Nashville. And the rest of Porter's story is history. 81 records on the country singles chart, his own syndicated TV show for more than 20 years, the introduction of one Dolly Parton to the world, nudie suits, and the Country Music Hall of Fame. The Porter Wagner show may have come out of Nashville, but it carried a good dose of the Ozarks with it. Wagner's first featured female singer in the pre-Dolly days was another product of the Ozark Jubilee, Norma Jean, and Speck Rhodes, a fellow West Plains native, provided the comedy. Don Warden didn't fare too badly for himself either. A longtime member of Wagner's band, the Wagon Masters, he founded a successful music publishing company with legendary guitarist Chet Atkins and served as Dolly Parton's manager. The Ozark Jubilee continued to roll on even after losing a major figure like Porter Wagner. The show became known as Country Music Jubilee in 1957 and two years later changed to Jubilee USA, but it continued to be broadcast from Springfield's Jewel Theater. The key to Jubilee's success had always been the star power of Red Foley, and when his personal life started to unravel, the show's days were numbered. Plagued by alcoholism and related marital troubles, Foley was charged with income tax evasion in late 1959. Guest hosts carried the show through most of its final nine months before ABC canceled Jubilee USA in September 1960. Cy Simon, Ralph Foster, and their Crossroads Productions gave it one more shot the following year with a new country music variety show broadcast on the NBC network from Springfield's Landers Theater. Five Star Jubilee featured many of the old Jubilee's regular performers alongside a rotating team of hosts including Eddie Arnold and Tex Ritter, but it lasted only six months. So the Ozark region's role as a small player on the national television stage came to an end in 1961. But just down the road in the little town of Branson, a group of brothers calling themselves the Bald Knobbers were wrapping up the second season of their stage show. It turns out there was still plenty of music and plenty of showbiz back in the hills of the Ozarks. So let's keep things on the upswing and have Red Foley take us out with a little bit of the Ozark Jubilee song, from a 1956 episode. Let's uh, sing a little song that kind of tells the whole story that goes on here at the Ozark Jubilee, and we're gonna have, let's have a little music over there, boys, and let's get the gang up on the floor there, huh? Take the fiddle off of the wall, all you love to go. We'll get the gang together to the spread as we will go. We'll pull hands around those two wings, turkey.
The latter half of the 1950s was a huge moment for music and entertainment in the Ozarks. For almost half a dozen years, the Ozark Jubilee was broadcast right out of downtown Springfield, Missouri's Jewel Theater into TV sets around the nation. The same Springfield-based production company that brought the Jubilee to the ABC TV network also produced summer replacement shows starring country music luminaries Eddie Arnold and Chet Atkins, as well as a short-lived ABC talent show. They even filmed the pilot for a hillbilly game show called Pig in a Poke, starring musician and comic actor Smiley Burnett. Sorry to break the news, but it was never picked up. The Ozark Jubilee brought performers from around the country to the Ozarks, but the show also showcased lots of homegrown talent. Many of the folks behind the scenes, as well as in front of the cameras, had cut their teeth on the country music programs produced by Springfield radio stations KWTO and KGBX. We know country legend Porter Wagner came straight out of that radio pipeline to the Jubilee and then on to country superstardom. But the Jubilee featured other talented locals as well. A comedy musical act appearing throughout the show's run was Lenny and Goo Goo, played by homegrown vaudeville veterans Lenny Ailsher and Floyd Rutledge, both of whom had toured with the popular stage show of the Weaver Brothers and Elviry. Gospel quartets were a mainstay of country variety programs in the 50s, and the Jubilee featured the close harmonies of the Springfield-based Foggy River Boys. The Philharmonics did the Foggies one better and added a fifth voice. This African-American quintet, four of whom were natives of Springfield, could sing any kind of music you pleased and maintained a busy touring schedule in addition to their frequent appearances on Ozark Jubilee. Backing up the Philharmonics on upright bass was future jazz legend Charlie Hayden, a native of southwest Missouri who played in the Jubilee House Band in the early days. But of the many Ozarkers who played and sang on the Jubilee from 1955 to 1960, one in particular stands out for his longevity on the Ozarks music scene. The tall feller Red Foley liked to call Slimbo. For half a century, few people in the Ozarks were more popular and appreciated than a poor farm boy from Christian County, Missouri named Clyde Wilson, better known as Slim for as long as anyone could recall. As a 20-year-old devotee of Jimmy Rogers, the yodeling brakeman from Mississippi, Slim Wilson had gotten his first taste of performing in 1930 when he sang on a Kansas City radio show. And when radio made its appearance in Springfield two years later, he was one of the first artists heard across the Ozarks. An able fiddler, though usually featured on the guitar, for more than two decades Slim was a regular on Springfield radio, fronting a variety of groups. The Goodwill Trio with his sister and nephew and later the Goodwill family when they added a fourth player, the Tall Timber Boys, and the Prairie Playboys. On the national radio show Corns a Kraken, he even played in a musical comedy duo called Flash and Whistler. He and his partner, former Springfield cop and taxi driver Floyd Goo Goo Rutledge, later reprised their act on Ozark Jubilee. And all the while, Slim and his wife Ada maintained a dairy farm outside of Springfield. All the more reason for country folks in the Ozarks to appreciate one of their own. Wilson usually performed commercial country or hillbilly music as it was known back then, but he had grown up on more traditional fare. He performed at the first region-wide Ozarks Folk Festival in Springfield in 1934, and one of his songs found its way into the Library of Congress's Depression-era Folk Recordings Library. When radio station KWTO celebrated Wilson's 25,000th broadcast from Springfield in 1954, he was just getting started. Within months, he and his tall timber boys were regulars on Ozark Jubilee, and from 1957 to 1961, he headed up the house band for Jubilee and its NBC successor, Five Star Jubilee. After a brief stint on another NBC show, Eddie Arnold's Today on the Farm, broadcast from Chicago, Slim Wilson returned to the Ozarks and in 1964 launched his local Slim Wilson show, which ran on Springfield's KYTV for 11 years. He continued to perform and entertain audiences with his all-shucks country boy modesty and his mastery of hundreds of songs into the 1980s. But the high point of Slim Wilson's career remained those days when Springfield challenged Nashville as the crossroads of country music. Let's go back in the hills and into that era 
to a January 1956 episode of Ozark Jubilee, we'll hear MC Red Foley introduce Slimbo's version of the Sonny James song, Pigtails and Ribbons. You know, so many wonderful things have happened to me in the last year over here in the Ozarks that I feel like I've lived here for many, many years. But I, I want you folks to say hello now. Come out here, will you, old Slimbo? Say hello to a fellow who actually has been here a long, long time. Slimbo Wilson. But uh, I think the truth of the matter is that uh, you was here before the mountains were, weren't you, Slim? They built the mountains around you. <laughs> yes, yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, see, here's an old boy who's in his 24th year on radio station KWTO in Springfield here. And, uh, Slim, that is quite a record. I hope you stay there 24 more. Thank you very much. And I hope that this is our jubilee. Your birthday here, boy. Well, it isn't just mine. I quit having birthdays, but uh, it was our jubilee. This is the first one, Slim. Thank you, buddy. And you're part of it, too, you know. Thank you. What is this tune? Uh, isn't this a tune you're going to do one that Sonny James wrote mm -hmm. and recorded? That's right. I hope old Sonny's looking in out there. Called, uh, what is it? Pigtails and Ribbons. Pigtails and Ribbons. Right. Slim up. <laughs> When you think of live music stage shows in the Ozarks, Branson is probably the first thing that comes to mind, but years before Branson became famous for its Highway 76 strip of music theaters, an energetic gang of Ozarkers entertained visitors to the Lake of the Ozarks with down-home music, dancing, and comedy, the same formula that proved the winner in Branson. Let's go back in the hills to learn the story of an underappreciated chapter in the history of the musical Ozarks, the Ozark Opry. The backstory of the Ozark Opry is the story of its founders, Lee and Joyce Mace. Both were natives of the northern Ozarks of Missouri. Lee, a Miller County farm boy, and Joyce, a girl who had grown up in a lake of the Ozarks town in Camden County. The young couple met at a dance in 1946. They were the best jig dancers on the floor that night, and before long they were members of the Lake of the Ozarks Square Dancers a troupe that performed at the 1948 National Folk Festival in St. Louis and then toured the country before Lee was drafted into the Army in 1950. While stationed in France, Lee found a discarded upright bass in a dump, repaired it, and learned to play. After his stint in the military was over, Lee Mace returned to Missouri, and he and Joyce reformed the Lake of the Ozark Square Dancers. Featured on Ted Mack's national TV show, The Original Amateur Hour, the dancers found themselves in high demand, appearing for extended stays in New Orleans and Reno before being hired to perform in the Grand Ole Opry at Nashville's Ryman Auditorium. The rechristened Grand Ole Opry Square Dancers appeared in the very first episode of the syndicated Grand Ole Opry TV show in 1954 and would eventually film about a hundred shows in Nashville over the next couple of years. But by this time, Lee and Joyce focused most of their attention on a project back home in the Ozarks. 
In 1953, Lee Mace had been hired as a DJ and program director at KRMS, a lake of the Ozarks area radio station. Changing the format from pop to country, Lee began doing live Sunday shows featuring local musicians. Before long, he and Joyce, still in their 20s, opened a live music stage show in an old lakeside restaurant. The house band for the stage show was the house band from those Sunday radio shows and consisted of Lee on upright bass alongside four other country boys from the Ozarks, guitarists Bob Penny and Bob McCoy, fiddler Orville Day, and banjo player Lonnie Hoppers, a teenager who had picked up Earl Scruggs' three-finger picking style. Catering primarily to audiences of lake tourists from Chicago and St. Louis, the Maces embraced the stereotypes their patrons brought with them to the Ozarks and put on an often over-the-top hillbilly shindig. Once the Ozark Opry became stable enough to move into a new theater seating 300 people in 1957, the Maces started to tone down the hillbilly somewhat, trading gingham dresses and checkered shirts for more contemporary garb. But the music stayed country, a mix of bluegrass and current country with an occasional gospel number, and the comedy stayed cornpone. And it remained a true ensemble production, a show without a central star. It was a winning, working formula, one that the May Brothers from southwestern Missouri took notice of in the mid-50s and later perfected in their Bald Knobbers Hillbilly Jamboree in Branson. In 1959, the Maces installed more than 800 theater seats salvaged from an old opera house in Kansas, and by the 60s, the Ozark Opry was on a roll, playing to sold-out audiences six nights a week, April through October, and the Opry gang toured extensively in the Midwest and South during the off-season. In addition to the successful stage show, in 1956, the Ozark Opry launched a locally produced 30-minute weekly show broadcast on a Jefferson City TV station. It lasted for almost 30 years. For a few years in the mid-60s, the Maces operated the Hillbilly Hootenanny next door to the Opry. The Hootenanny was geared toward the tastes of folkies and featured local singers doing their best Joan Baez and Kingston Trio impersonations. The sounds of the Ozark Opry changed through the decades with the shifting tastes and styles in mainstream country music, and it survived challenges. In the early 80s, the Maces fought off a lawsuit from the company that owned the Grand Ole Opry, a suit trying to force the Maces to stop using the word Opry or to pay for its usage. A federal judge eventually ruled that the Nashville show had no monopoly on the term Opry, a once common hill country pronunciation of opera. But it was less than a year and a half later that Lee Mace was killed in a plane crash. Joyce carried on with the show for 20 more years, closing the doors on the Ozark Opry for good at the end of the 2005 season. From jig dancing square dancers to Lake of the Ozarks legends, Lee and Joyce Mace were pioneers of Ozarks music and entertainment. They're both gone now, but the legacy of the Ozark Opry lives on. Here's Lee and some of his musicians from an episode of Lee Mace's Ozark Opry on Jefferson City, Missouri's KRCG-TV. Let's go to the house, gang. Here we go. For the past half hour, you've been watching Ozark Opry, 30 minutes of music country style with Lee Mace and the gang from the beautiful Lake of the Ozarks. This program has been pre-recorded.